received from the law and the jurisprudence of Europe. Therefore, how European law has been developed can help us to catch the meaning or purpose of our laws following from Europe. I believe we will learn much from today's uh, speech and uh, discussions. Um, I'm sorry to say, I have a, a class <laughs> later, so I have to leave uh, now. But, uh, I hope you have uh, enjoyed uh, these activities. Thank you. Thank you, Wang Laoshi. Well, I'm, I'm going to mix up uh, my language in order to get everybody to understand. We don't have a, a huge audience today, so and, and we have a lot of time. Uh, 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 good morning, and I welcome all of you to be here. Uh, uh, Professor Wang just uh, introduced uh, Professor uh, Conte, our speaker today, and uh, he has to rush for his class. Uh, professor Conte is now a uh, professor of medieval and modern law in uh, uh, the Italian University uh, Rome III, and is also with joint appointment uh, a, a director of research at the French institution uh, EHESS. Uh, uh, he, uh, his major is uh, uh, medieval law and a lot of uh, historiography with a critical perspective uh, of the 19th and 20th century. And, uh, in front, of, in front of me, there are four other guests, and I will introduce them. Uh, they, they will uh, join us after uh, Mr. Conte's speech and uh, give us some short comments and opinions about what they think or uh, about legal history, their teaching experience, what they expect and what they do not expect from students. Uh, they probably won't get in, uh, involved with the recent online controversy that you all know about that probably it is uh, worthless to, um, it's not worthwhile to study legal theory. I'm happy that nobody cares about legal history, so nobody really posts on that uh, internet page to complain that legal history is useless because it's self-evident. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so from my, from my left side, uh, 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 Professor Claudia Storti uh, from uh, uh, University of Milan, and uh, please. <laughs> And uh, Professor uh, Professor uh, Suasi Kamnes uh, Bari West, uh, uh, it used to be uh, a Paris 10. Professor uh, Beatrice Pasciuta from uh, Palermo, Italy. And Professor Ben Kanowski from Bayreuth, Germany. And our four guests uh, cover a wide range of uh, legal histori uh, historical specialty. Uh, Professor Storti's uh, uh, expertise covers uh, early Middle Age, uh, Lomb Lombard King Kingdom, and uh, municipal legislations. Uh, Professor Kelly's uh, specialty is late Roman Empire and early Middle Age, both of them are very obscure or very far uh, remote uh, uh, geographical region and uh, chronological period for Taiwanese readers and students. And Professor Pashuta's specialty is the highly complicated uh, Sicily, the, the biggest island on the uh, Mediterranean Sea, where Greek, Roman, uh, Jews, uh, Muslims lived, used to live together and had a uh, very uh, uh, complicated interwoven legal order. And Professor Kanowski is the leading specialist uh, of the, the German law book, Saxon Spiegel. Uh, he insists that, that this law book uh, is a literal translation of a kind of private compilation of what people think law is and what they heard about law, and it's not a, um, an official enactment. Then I will uh, give the floor back to Professor Conte. He will talk, uh, tell us about legal arguments, the, the medieval origins of a European intervention. Thank you, Tung Mu. Uh, of course, it's a great honor and a pleasure to be here. And uh, also a very difficult task to uh, to get in contact with you with your curiosity about uh, uh, my topics. I don't know what you know about these topics about European legal history. I don't know what you have read 
about Roman law and the strange journey of Roman law through time and space from uh, ancient uh, Italy to the world Euro, to the United States, to the Eastern countries like Japan, China, uh, Taiwan, India, the common law. There is uh, many different narratives about these topics. Uh, today I will go uh, through these narratives and I will challenge them trying to go back to a particular period of uh, the history of Roman law in Europe, which is uh, uh, the very well, basic period in which everything began. Uh, and I want to challenge the common narratives of this journey of, of Roman law through the adherence of some uh, historical sources. Also, in order to show that legal history, uh, contrary to what uh, Tsumu Wu just said, is useful because it is a way to understand some basic principle of the law, of the European law, both in Europe and everywhere in the world, uh, given the fact that uh, many very important countries all over the world have adopted some European logics by applying, by dealing with the concept of law. So, uh, uh, my lecture could be a little bit difficult for some of you. In this case, uh, you can raise your hands and raise questions uh, to and, and either me or uh, to Mu will uh, clarify things. Uh, to Mu we can also use your, your, uh, your language and be more clear than I have. So, uh, I say I would like to deal with this very central object. The relationship between Europe and the Roman law. It is very central since a lot of time. Is, is, is it? Yes? I just, uh, um, I, I, I am quoting here in this slide. Three, uh, three very important books about these topics uh, in three different uh, European languages. As you see, I'm taking account the period after Second World War. Second World War, as you know, was a great destruction for the world of the world, but particularly in Europe, which was the main theater of uh, Second World War. And just after, uh, scholars started to ask themselves what was the role of Roman law in the reconstruction of the legal sensibility after uh, the, uh, the tragedy of Second World War. And in this sense, uh, the very important book of Paul Koschaker, Europa und das Römische Recht, Europe and the Roman Law, is really a milestone. In this book, uh, Koschaker explained in which sense we can say that the Roman law is a way to unify Europe because the tradition of this complex of laws, which is called Roman law, is uh, had a history everywhere in every country of Europe. So, as you see, after having fighted the one against the other, uh, the, the lands, the countries of, Roman law, of Europe started to think to be unified on the base of a, of a common past, of a common legal past, which was, which was identified in this object, which was, which was Roman law. Shortly after, uh, an Italian scholar, Francesco Calasso, was very much impressed by the book of Koschaker, which he wanted to be translated into Italian, but also tried to propose a slightly different view, which was a more historical one, because following Calasso, this idea of Roman law was a little bit too abstract, and it was uh, a, a kind of dominating law over all other variety of existing law in Europe. 
And the idea of Calasso was that Roman law was uh, a kind of treasure of concepts you can use to coordinate different laws which were all uh, in uh, force in different countries of Europe. Now, at the end of the last century, 1999, uh, came out an important book of Reinhard Zimmermann, a book very beautiful to read, uh, whose title is Roman Law, Contemporary Law, European Law. I forgot to, to put the last, uh, the last part of the title. Uh, written in a beautiful English, uh, which well, goes back to the tradition of Koshaker, trying to, uh, uh, to go back to this idea of a general spreading of a bunch of uh, uh, legal institution which forms the uh, uh, Roman law. But what does it mean, Roman law? What exactly do we mean as we say that Japan, for instance, or China adopted Roman law? What means this? Because there is no Roman law in, in force in Japan. There is not a law written in Latin. No, all laws are written in Japanese. But the same question is also valid for Europe. What does it mean? Hmm? As we say that during the Middle Ages, Roman law became the shared common law of Europe. This is the question I want to raise today. And the narrative about this uh, arises in European 19th century and goes on to the whole 20th century. The basis of this is that the legacy of Roman law to modern era is made by legal institutions. And this word, this expression, legal institutions, is a little bit difficult to understand because we have in English and in French the same word institution uh, to mean both an institution as a university, as an institute, as a, a school which can be considered an institution but also a legal institution can be the property the contract, the legal personality. Hmm? Well, in German, there are two words to, um, to, to mean this two meaning of the word institution. And to mean property, uh, contracts, so abstract concepts, uh, the Germans use the word institute. We, the Italians, copied the Germans because we did not mean uh, contra, uh, institute, uh, instituto uh, by meaning contracts. But uh, after the Germans, the German news, we started to distinguish between istituzione, institution, the university, and istituto, the property. So, this very German idea of the existence of Rechtsinstitute, so institutes, institution in the sense of concepts, is at the core of the idea of what is Roman law. In which sense Roman law colonized and went over uh, everywhere in Europe. So, apparently, by following this 19th and 20th century narrative, Roman law spread everywhere because the institutions, the institute of Roman law were so perfect that everywhere, that in every country of Europe, uh, people adopted them as the best <coughs> solution for legal issues. Where the European country have founded this institution? Well, in a very big book. And this book is called Corpus Juris Civilis. 
the Corpus Juris Civilis uh, collects all the most important part of Roman law and being a wall, a unique collection, is very good to travel everywhere to apply uh, legal institutions. And what happened in the Middle Ages? It happened that these very books were read very carefully and commentated with sets of comments which are called glosses, we will uh, see some of them in a while, and also commented. And what was, why these texts were studied and commented? In order to extract from the text legal institutions to adopt, to apply everywhere in Europe. This is, in my opinion, the narrative which is very largely spread everywhere in Europe and, I ask you, I think probably also here, as you study what is Roman law and why you have to be concerned with this uh, very uh, ancient European institution uh, living at so many thousands of miles away from Italy. This is the Corpus Juris Civilis, just to uh, uh, recall what maybe you already know. It is a collection made by Justinian, uh, the Roman Emperor, already after the fall of Western Roman Empire, Justinian was living in Istanbul, uh, in Constantinople, at the time when the Corpus Juris was uh, written. And between 500, uh, 529 and 534. The most important thing is that this collection of books were forgotten for almost 500 years. Nobody read them and nobody used them outside of very little pieces which were preserved for a lot of time. The contents, as you maybe already know, is uh, uh, imperial laws, a collection of laws made by Roman emperors, uh, a handbook for the students of first year, which is called the Institutes, and sometimes in our legal handbook we still use the word Institutes. And then the Digest. The Digest is the biggest part, this, this one, speaks more bigger than the code. Hmm? Uh, and the digest collects fragments, uh, extracts from the works written by uh, Roman jurists of the classic era until the third century. Now, this very historical problem is extremely important in the history of Roman law and by consequence is very important for legal theory everywhere given the fact that everywhere we say that Roman law is the base of modern uh, legal uh, systems. This historical problem is the gap between antiquity and rediscovery of the sources of antiquity. This is a, a a distinctive feature of European history and it's probably different from what happened in uh, the Eastern country, in, uh, uh, in Japan, in China. Because European history has a fracture in between. The great antiquity has not a continuous history until today there is a big fracture, which is called, since 500 years, the Middle Ages. This is middle in the sense that it is a separation between antiquity and the renewal of antique sources. And this distinctive feature means that the attitude of Europe towards its past is different, is peculiar, because past is far. There is a border between us and our past. So the antique, the antiquity is ourselves. We European, we are the heirs of antiquity. But at the same time, antiquity is far from ourselves. 
This made probably one of the most uh, uh, complex cultural feature of European mentality. And we have to take into account this gap as we think that this uh, collection of law had not a continuous history because it was lost and then rediscovered. So we had to uh, focus on this rediscovering. So the most important part of the Corpus Juris, the digest, which contained the wise uh, expression of, of, uh, of the knowledge of the lawyers, is the digest. And the digest was very big. And it was rediscovered in, uh, well, after the year 1000, let's say uh, between uh, 1050 and 1100. Uh, and it was completely recopied. It was copied in many copies. You know, this was a, a very, very heavy work to write down all these hundreds of pages. And it was very expensive because in Europe at that time they wrote on skin of animals, parchment. And if you want to write, let's say, eight pages of the digest, you have to kill a sheep. And a sheep is a very valuable thing. And if you want to write a world book, you have to kill hundreds of sheep. You know? So a book is a very valuable thing because of the work it needs and of the, the value of the matter of, of the thing itself. So why did they do that? And the traditional answer was because they wanted to learn the content of these books and write losses to explain what it meant. But by the matter of fact, the first glosses, the first small commentaries, does not explain the text. They do not explain anything. They just quote other passages of the same book of or the other books in the digest, they quote the code, or other passages of the same digest. Let's have a look of, of how it works. This is the text, which is copied, and here we have glosses. Some of them are explanation. They need some words to explain it something. But the great majority are very short and they just quote, say, if you read this, you have to read also that. They quote and you turn the pages and you look for the place, the, the passage which is quoted. You see? So, what were written for the first works of the first glossators? First of all, the, the work was to discover all the text, to put everything together and to copy the original text of the code, of the digest, of the institutes and of the uh, other parts. Majority of the first classes just quote all the text. And in the historical sources we find that the first practical quotation in, uh, in court of this text hmm, are always in the frame of procedure, of trials. So we see that there was not this fascination for the perfection of the institution, of legal institution. There was a use of the force of this law in order to win trials in court. And to show this, I want to show you three examples of three uh, lawyers of the 12th century. Two of them are extremely well known, and the third is not very well known. Uh, Bulgarus uh, is the most ancient. Uh, the second uh, of which I will speak is not very well known. Is a canonist whose name is Pierre de Blois. 
And the third is again a very well-known lawyer called Pilius, who was active in Italy uh, towards the end of the 12th century. He died at the beginning of the 13th. Well, let's start with Bulgarus. Uh, I don't know if you have had a, a, a course of comparative law or legal history speaking about the origins of the school of Bologna. No. Well, in Europe, every student uh, studied this happening of the beginning of the first school of law, which is the University of Bologna in Italy. And there is a, a legendary founder of this, uh, uh, of this university whose name is Irnerius. But uh, his uh, historical reality is more and more challenging. So we can today say that the real founder in historical sources of this first school of law was his student, Bulgarus. Well, Bulgarus uh, probably had uh, well, followed courses uh, by Irnerius, but Bulgarus was the one who structured the school as a real school and left many uh, traces of his passage in Bologna. Now, what is the first historical uh, testimony, witness of, uh, of his uh, life? It is a letter. It is a letter he wrote to an extremely important man of that age. He was a kind of prime minister of uh, the Church of Rome, the Chancellor Haimericus, one of the most powerful men in the world at that time. Well, apparently Haimericus has written to Bulgarus with a very precise question. Please, Bulgarus, explain me how it works, the Roman trial. Give me the outline of Roman procedure. And we have the answer of Bulgarus to this letter. He feels very much honored by the, ask, by, by the question asked by uh, Aymericus. And then he writes a short draft, simplified draft, of the functioning of the main features of the trial in the Roman sources. He was the best knower of the corpus juris at that age. And Aymericus was right to ask him to answer to this. So, in this letter there are, of course, many things, many important things. I will just underline one. He says, for the first time after century, that in a trial, and I quote, there must be three persons, the plaintiff, the defendant, and the judge. And he adds, the judge is made by public authority. Well, this is a kind of revolution in the 12th century. Because both in the, in the feudal system and in the church system, Justice was made by the superior to the inferior. So it was a fact of only two persons, not three. There was not a public power which uh, well, settled the dispute between two persons. So this principle is really revolutionary. And this is why in the same years, 1135, the Pope writes two letters to insist on the fact that now every, uh, everyone can appeal to the uh, tribunal of the Pope even against his superior. This is a great revolution because until uh, that time it was enforced a rule in the Church which said we have never seen that a sheep could sue his shepherd. And as every Christian is like a sheep and the bishop is the shepherd, no priest could sue his shepherd. So this is a big revolution and we see 
the connection uh, between this revolution and Roman law by this very war of Bulgarus. So Bulgarus, writing back to Americus, describes the persons, the actors of a trial, plaintiff, defendant, judge, the witness, and so on. And then he has answered to the question. And in many manuscripts of this letter, there is an appendix. And this appendix is interesting because uh, uh, Bulgarus adds, I consider very appropriate now, I finished an answer to you, but now I consider very appropriate to say also something about the rules of law for what is possible in a short space. So I, I don't want to write a big treaty, I just want to write the essential. I beg you to consider this as a gift of friendship, although it seems not to be sufficient as to the level of doctrine. So, this structure of the trial is connected in the mind of Bulgarus to the idea of rule of law. Now, in Latin, rule of law is called regula juris. Hmm? And, uh, and it is, of course, a basic concept of how to argue in court. And it is very important from the moment that you say that a trial has to have a plaintiff and a defendant and a public judge. What do they do, the plaintiff and the defendant? They argue. They use rules. You know? So now there is a, a, a strange history which also you have to connect with the idea of the gap between antiquity and rediscovery of antiquity. And it is a very historical uh, happening. Well, more than historical, it is a philological happening. Philological, you know what, what it means, philological? Philology is the, the, uh, the science which reconstructs the wording, the word of ancient texts. Okay? Well, what is a rule of law? It was described in the digest. So, Bulgarians had just to read the digest to, uh, to learn what is a rule of law. But the definition given by Bulgarians uh, is slightly different from what we read in the digest. Uh, he starts saying, a rule gives a brief narration of the dispute. Then he says other things, but uh, at the end he says the rule, it is as if it was the conjunction of single things. Conjunction. So you build a rule by making a conjunction to join together different things. So Bulgarus developed the idea, which is typical for the, the whole uh, history of, of, of legal knowledge, that a regular is a general statement based on different statutes. Law states different things, and the lawyer makes a general rule by connecting all different uh, orders given by the law. Now, what is interesting is that this passage arises from an error of medieval uh, copyists, medieval scribes. Hmm? This is the original text of the digest in the antiquity, at the time of Justinian. Per regulam igito, for the rule, we have almost a Cause coniectio. Coniectio means a statement of a case. Okay? Oh, oh. Coniectio cause means a statement of the case. 
because causa is a Latin word which can mean both cause and case. Okay? And if we use the word coniectio, which means to throw up, so to state in front of the judge what is the case he has to judge. Well, the scribes in Middle Ages did not write coniectio, they wrote coniunctio, because it was easier, it was a more common word. So by copying, they made this error, and they wrote just conjunction, not coniectio. Okay? So this change of two letters in the word changes also the meaning of the word causa. Because you don't use the first meaning case, but you use the second meaning cause. And cause is a, a philosophical word which uh, is the reason of a text. So, for this strange historical happening, the very meaning of a central sentence of the Digest changed from antiquity to the Middle Ages. And as the ancient jurists thought that a regular is to go to the judge and state the case in front of him, the medieval thought that the regular is to look in different laws of the corpus juris and to make a conjunction of the meaning of the reasons of these laws. You want to say something, uh, to make an example in Chinese for them about uh, 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 philology and so on? Uh, candlelight, the scribe copy uh, with very bad sight, then uh, put one word for another. Okay, I hope to be to have been uh, correct, but you have to think back. Is that Roman law that travels through time, or is a new use of Roman law? Of course, is a new use. It's something new because no Roman lawyer had thought of this conjunction of causes. No, that the Roman meaning of regular was not the same in Roman law and in medieval law, you know? So the gap between antiquity and uh, discovery of antiquity is extremely important to understand what means hmm, uh, Roman law in European history. Uh, Burgos was very much aware of the importance of this system of rules of law, so that he wrote also as a bigger tract on the rules of law. This is a, a, a 19th century edition of this uh, tract, and here you can see also a manuscript of it. Sir. This is just to show you how it looks like. So, uh, what is a regular, what is a rule? It's a general law, in a general rule of law, with its contradiction. Because as I look for different texts in the world uh, corpus juris, I find that different laws, as happens also today, are contradictory. And the work of the lawyer is to, to connect everything together, even if that there are some contradictions. I take an example. In Roman law, a woman cannot be procured at law. There is a law which says that. But there are other laws that say a woman can be procured at law for herself. She, she, she can also defend herself. Uh, she can defend her parents. She can defend her children, the family in general. 
you know. So a general rule is that in general you have to avoid that the woman uh, can be proper, but there are many exceptions. So you have to find a general reconstruction of this. So you see that a rule of law is in itself contradictory. Is a way to hold together contradictory statutes. Now, this contradictory, this uh, this contradiction, which are present in the corpus juris and in all legal systems, are also very important to understand the developing of the normativity of legal text, because thanks to contradiction thanks to the technique to hold together contradictory laws, you also have to affirm the normative character of every valid norm. So the lawyer cannot pretend that a law does not exist, as it happened before in the early Middle Ages. He has to take into account the existence of a, a, a valid norm, even if uh, it, it makes problems in its relationship with other norms, which is the contrary. And so a lawyer must be capable of making a general statement through which you can give a, a, a acknowledge validity to every norm, despite the contradictory character of different so, the renaissance of the idea of legally binding norms is connected with the idea of contradiction. You have to be a good lawyer because laws are contradictory. If laws were simple and non-contradictory, you would not need the presence of lawyers. So, in this sense, we have to take into account that in Middle Ages, Science, legal sciences, is not systematic. It doesn't construct great concepts. It goes on with contradictions. It, it, it goes forward towards the truth thanks to contradiction. Being aware that the truth knows only God. And so the, the, the scientist will never grasp the real truth. But he can, he, can, he can try more and more to approach the truth through contradiction. This is very clear in the, in the tract about the uh, laws of the church, written by this not very well known canonist in northern France, Pierre de Blois, who wrote, uh, who wrote a, 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 a summary of canon law. And he, at the beginning of this summary, he insists on this fact. There are many rebellions of canons. Canons is the name of laws in the church law. Of canons against each other. To bring the peace among these contradictory norms, we need a technique, which is a dialectic technique, which we call distinctio. Distinctio means to distinguish. In this case, we apply this norm, and in the other case, we apply the contrary norm, like in the case of the woman. Uh, if uh, someone wants to be defended by a woman, we apply the norm that for, uh, forbid uh, this. But if this someone is uh, the child of this woman, we can apply the other norm, which permit that the woman uh, is proper. So he says we can bring the light from darkness uh, to light uh, from darkness the meaning of the canons only by exploring the descent emerging among them. So you see, the descent, the contradiction brings light in the canon. And if we look to the manuscript of this text, it is very clear that it is produced in this way. Look, this is the text of Pierre de Blois in the center, and you have laws, so canons of canon law, 
on the left they say something, and on the right there is the contradiction, the contradictory canon. So the science of law is in the middle between contradictions, also in the page of the manuscript. You know, it's very clear that uh, uh, medieval legal sciences is not systematic. It exists because of contradiction. Pierre de Roy uh, insists also in uh, one other point and says that it is very important. I don't know why I did not uh, translate into English this. Well, I forgot. But I can translate it thus. Two. Uh, know the law, it is extremely useful to go to court. Not only in the university, but also to court. You have to make both. Because uh, in uh, the school, you know the theory. But in the court, you will know the practice. So there is been this connection since the beginning. You see, we are at the beginning of uh, teaching and learning law and from the beginning there is two aspects of teaching and learning theory and practice we cannot think of a, 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 a school of law without connecting these two two elements we cannot think of a school of law without theory and we cannot think of a theory of law without practice so the two elements are there since the beginning. And I think we have also to think of that as we think of, uh, uh, of uh, reformation of uh, the teaching of law. So from the beginning, a lawyer is a professional who knows how to coordinate different and contradictory uh, legal norms. From the beginning, from the new beginning, so in the 12th century, a legal norm is binding. And this binding character of legal law is extremely important in order to allow the developing of legal knowledge. The absolute binding force of legal norm is connected with the rationality of the trial, theory and practice. I can go in court to defend my client by arguing because <clears throat> I can quote uh, uh, binding legal laws. And uh, this is why in the 12th century there is a, a new very important uh, protagonist of society which is a new professional, the lawyer, which did not exist before. Now we introduce a new protagonist. Lawyers are start to be everywhere. Let's go back to Italy after north of France, and uh, we are approaching the end of this uh, uh, of this lecture. Pius was a, a professor of law, very brilliant, who started teaching in Bologna. But after a while, he received a very good proposition by the nearby city of Modena, and he left the big university of Bologna to, to found a new university in, the, uh, in Modena. Being there, he renovated very, very deeply the system of teaching, writing his uh, new handbook for lawyers, whose name is Libellus Disputatorius, which means the book to dispute, to, uh, of controversy. Uh, Pius uh, is uh, well known in the handbooks for legal history in Europe, but nobody uh, remembers that uh, he has many connections with the world of uh, theology, of scholasticism, uh, all over Europe. And this is very clear by what he says in the introduction of his handbook, which is a very strong piece of uh, literature. He is 
uh, is really uh, criticizing very much the university from which he came from, Bologna. And he says, today the students stay at the university for 10 years. Imagine that the average age at this, at this time was 30, 35 years. And the students spent 10 of these years in the university to learn uh, law. And to learn all the useless apparatuses of glosses, which is ridiculous, says uh, Pius. This is why, says Pius, I have published this very useful book by which one will find easily arguments to use in every kind of case. So if you look at the, at the handbook of Bilius, you will find the arguments, so normative binding texts to argue in court. And you will find this easily without working for 10 years learning everything by heart. And so it ends with its nice phrase, get up, get up, get up, it repeats three times. Uh, you students from your lazy sleepiness, made by so many authors, throw away the glosses and study the same text, the very text. Take my handbook to learn how to discuss. And in just four years, it's a kind of commercial, you know, take my book and in just four years, you will learn what you are now barely able to learn in 10. After which, you will go back home, perfectly educated. You have also to think that to, to be at the university was very expensive. They were very far away from home, and uh, they traveled by feet, so it, it was also a hard time for students. Well, sometimes it was very funny, but also uh, it could be hard. So what there is in this book of, uh, of Pius? Well, there are quotations of passages and, and uh, rules, general rules, to put all these contradictions together. So as you go in court, you can choose the text you, you uh, are the most useful for your client and, and fight against the other who will use the other text. But if you have the book of Pius in the hand, you will uh, do that very quickly. So, uh, this is why this list of contradictions are called generalia, general. Because they give general uh, solutions. So, let's sum up what I try to say through these uh, different examples. First, the discovery of Roman law in the 11th and 12th century was not a reception of legal institution. There is no institution and there is a completely new reading of this whole text. Second, the scholastic treatment of this text was driven by the new needs of a new trial. They did all this work because they wanted to introduce a rational trial and to, and to uh, uh, introduce also public judges. This connection, we saw the connection also in Pierre de Blois, practice and theory, but it is clear since the beginning, since 1135, Bulgarus to draw the connection between this kind of procedure and the need of legal arguments. So a rule of law is not a descriptive phrase. <coughs> It is useful because it raises contradiction. But also it shapes general principle to manage these contradictions. You see how far we are from the idea I, I began with legal institutions, the contract. 
this has not this has no meaning at this age. So also this treatment of contradiction are also the base of a great new thing in Europe, which is the binding force of every valid norm, which gives a lot of work to the lawyers because binding norms are contradiction and will be forever until today. So legal education consists in learning how to use arguments and this is what builds the new category of lawyers and this is why since eight centuries students go to law schools to learn how to be lawyers and this is why since all this time we are going back to this source of this argumentation which is Roman law this is maybe a more well actual explanation of why the Roman law system has had these big influences. It's not because of the perfection of its legal institution. It is because on the base of this and of the Roman trial, Western society has developed the professionality of lawyers. And this is why law began a theory, and this is why we still today are uh, uh, building and reforming and working in law schools everywhere in the world. Thank you very much.